Well, how you doing, Victorville? Hey, it's, it's snowed this week. How many of you guys got snow? You got snowed in with a half, a half inch of snow and you didn't know what to do, right? Yeah, we're glad you're here. Also want to welcome our other campuses. Uh, they had snow there too. Apple Valley, Hesperia, Phelan especially. We had a foot out by, we live closer to the pass, but Cheryl and I had a lot of, a lot of snow. Hanging with our snowmies this year at Thanksgiving. What a great uh, weekend it's been. Uh, some of you are wondering why I'm wearing this shirt. I, we have conflict in our home, and, and I, I want to, I hate to drag you into it, but it is what it is, and you'll understand as I explain uh, a little bit now. Um, we have 10 grandchildren, and they're all wonderful, five grandsons and five beautiful granddaughters. And so before the big game, it, you may not know, if you're new to High Desert Church, I was born and raised a Bruin. And so um, that's why I'm feeling real awkward uh, right now. But before last week's game, grandson number two, one of the USC fans, three of her grandsons are USC fans. So this is Colton Thomas. And Colton Thomas was a little, he was agitating me a little bit about the upcoming game, saying, you know, my Trojan's going to crush your Bruins. And I'm, uh, I'm thinking, well, you never know, Colton. Sometimes the Bruins rise up and do the unexpected. And, and, and he said, well, you want to bet? <laughs> and in a moment, a moment of delirium, I said, yes, I, I would love to do that. And he said, okay, if the Bruins win, Colton would wear a UCLA cap or T-shirt to school for a day. And if USC won, then Papa would have to wear a, U, a USC cap or T-shirt to work for a day. And so after, you know, the obvious outcome, I, I asked around and no, you know, no one on our staff, no USC fan on our staff who we mistakenly hired, uh, they, <laughs> none of them had a, a cap to borrow. And so I finally had to buy something and a shirt was less expensive than a, a cap. So here I am. It's a work day for me. And this is... This is why I'm dressed the way I am. Actually, only three of our grandsons root for USC. The other two are Bruin fans. In fact, uh, one, his name is Ace Bruin. And this is the irony of, of God. Our, the other, his little brother, Ace Bruin's little brother, Augie, w will become a Bruin fan, there is no doubt. And he has red hair. Can you, so I don't even know what to tell you, how the Lord has brought balance to the force. Um, but I am a grandfather of my word, and this rivalry between the Bruins and the Trojans, as long as you keep it in perspective, don't take it too seriously, but it's a lot of fun. Uh, but I, I, I am honoring my vow. I'm wearing the USC shirt today. I told him I'd wear it. I didn't tell him I wouldn't uh, cover it up while I'm <laughs> reaching, so I just got to do. I just got to do what I got to do, so anyway. And is there anything we can do about this set? There you go. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Makes me feel much better. Gary, my Trojan friend down here in the front row is wearing blue today. Thank you, brother. <laughs> Probably Dodger blue though, right? Yeah, okay. Get away with that. That's all I got, so we'll see you next week. We have, um, we have uh, a series that we're launching today, the greatest story ever told. This, this season, uh, Christmas season, Disney's actually releasing a great, a great film, we hope. I mean, those of us who are Star Wars fans have been following the Star Wars story forever. Um, some of you don't remember a world without Star Wars because you're, you're young. I remember as a young man watching the first of the nine, the ninth is coming out, for those of you who are not sci-fi people, uh, the ninth is coming out in a few weeks, but uh, I remember watching the first film with Cheryl on a Betamax machine. You remember these machines? How many of you remember the Betamax? Yeah, see, this is an old church. We have, uh, we, we, we had to rent this because nobody owned one for a while, so we rented this and we were watching the first Star Wars film, it was 1981, right after we got married, 
It was four years after the movie was released. I'm a slow adapter, right? So four years later, we're watching this in our home. And I remember watching as, you know, the opening credits, the way Star Wars works, and you know this now. Of course you do now. Uh, episode four was rolling up the screen. And I was trying to rewind the tape to get to episodes one through three. I didn't know. So uh, anyway, now we know how the whole thing works. And this year, we'll watch film number nine. Not on a Betamax. Now we're going to watch it on the IMAX, right? So our lives are defined by that journey from Betamax to IMAX. The life of Tom Mercer from Betamax to IMAX. But we're excited about that. Christmas always tends to bring, um, there's so much going on. I don't know if this is the case for you. It's the case for me. I can only speak for myself. Christmas seems to yeah, like pull us to the end of the year. Time goes by so quickly. And December 1st is now here. It has arrived. And now Christmas is, is like it's going to yank us very, very quickly to the end of this year and the beginning of, of a new one. And we get so focused on that. The fact that, you know, oh, time flies and Christmas events and we got Christmas schedules and we got Christmas expenses. Yikes, we got so many expenses. And we forget what a great story Christmas is. When you just stop and think about it, and maybe it's because we have retold the story time and time again. I am now teaching through the Christmas story for the 37th consecutive year, just at High Desert Church. And so it's a story that is so familiar, and yet one that we continue to tell, because it is the greatest story ever told. You know, a truly great story has a lot of great components, has great plot. It's got great characters in it. It's got a great uh, setting. It, it has great conflict. And then the resolution at the end brings the audience to this very great and satisfying conclusion. And while we marvel about Star Wars, about how one storyline has captured the attention of three generations for over four decades... But the Christmas story, the greatest story ever told, has captured the hearts and minds of a hundred generations for over 200 decades. So I'm thinking, what makes it so great, really? I mean, whoa, you know, carve out 10 bucks to go see a great movie, maybe the next Star Wars movie. But we'll spend a lot more than 10 bucks on Christmas. Raise your hand, all campuses, raise your hand if your Christmas budget is larger than $10. Raise your hand, please. There you go. I mean, we will just pour so many resources because this story has mesmerized, mesmerized, mesmerized us. It's, it's the shirt, bro. I can't talk. Anyway, and then long after the... Long after the Millennium Falcon is, is just another, another memory, no longer the centerpiece of a theme park, Christmas will still be the greatest ever, and we'll still be telling it. And so over the next few decades, well, we're going to, decades, I'm telling we're going to teach this story for decades. We, over the next few weekends, over the next few weekends, this is what we're going to do. We're going to dissect the, the story of Christmas uh, and apply uh, rules of analysis. I mean, how would you evaluate any story? We're going to apply those same rules to the Christmas story and just see what we get. And so today we're going to talk about the first ingredient of a great story, and that's a great conflict. The USC-UCLA rivalry is not the greatest conflict ever fought. Christmas is. Conflict is in Christmas. You know, we talk a lot about the sleepy side of Christmas. We like the quiet, you know, silent night, playing in the background, little baby Jesus there, you know, and the lights, and we got the eggnog and the little ginger snaps, and I got my, I got my iced tea, non-alcoholic, I must say, and so we are drinking, uh, you know, our tea, and we're enjoying, and it's just so relaxing. C Christmas is is not relaxing. Christmas has stress, man. It is tense. The story is like so intense. Great stories are rooted in a compelling conflict, and Christmas is no different. And this conflict is not taking place in a galaxy far, far away. This conflict is like right here on this planet. 
In fact, it continues right here every day, that same conflict. I'm a, a rock and roll guy. I like rock and roll music. I'm it's just my style. Not, you know, too loud now. <laughs> but one of my favorite words when I was growing up, when I was in the 70s growing up as a young man, Motown. I mean, I was all about Motown. And the Temptations, raise your hand if you remember them. <laughs> See, this is a Betamax Temptations congregation. I love you guys. You remember this song, Ball of Confusion? Of course you remember it because you love Motown. And that's what the Temptations sang. I would like to sing that song for you right now. But God told me I couldn't. I will read lyrics. <laughs> lyrics say, ball of confusion, that's what the world is today. Hey, hey. Remember this? Eve of destruction, tax deduction, city inspectors, bill collectors. Goes on to talk about evolution, revolution, gun control, sound of soul, shooting rockets to the moon, kids growing up too soon. And politicians say more taxes will solve everything. And the band played on. Man, that band's still playing on. Great Google Mooga, can't you hear me talking to you? Just a ball of confusion. That was 50 years ago. And some things haven't changed. It's still filled with so much conflict. You ever wondered why? Why is there so much political turmoil in the United States? I mean, my goodness. Can this country agree on anything? Why is there so much conflict between nations? Why is there so much conflict in the body of Christ? I mean, so much public conflict, public arguing, Christian leaders shaming one another publicly over theological disagreements. Why do you have so much conflict in your family? I read this week, this last week, I read that Americans can only take four hours of family during the holidays. <laughs> okay, we're tapped out. Read about it from the first book of the Bible all the way to the last chapter of the Bible. And the end of the world. It's like conflict. Conflict's like dominoes throughout history. One just knocking the other one over. Never seems to end. You know how many generations it took humanity before we experienced our first homicide? One. And the band played on. And you look at the Christmas narrative. And, and there is this international crisis embedded in the Christmas story. If every compelling story involves conflict, then at the heart of every conflict is this compelling villain. You know, movie makers, filmmakers call them great villains. Every story has to have a great villain. Well, if it's not a movie, then it's not a great villain. It's a horrible villain. And certainly there's one in the Christmas story. He's as gnarly as Darth Vader ever was. But he doesn't have the repentant heart that Darth Vader eventually showed. Pick up the action, Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. Here we go. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. King Herod. That King Herod is a guy named Herod the Great. And he ruled the province of Judea from 37 B.C. to 4 B.C. And Jesus was born during his reign, which means Jesus was born before himself. Jesus was born B.C. And that's just how the numbers work out historically. This guy was decisive and he was brutal. He rewarded his friends and he murdered his rivals. He was paranoid. He tortured his friends to discover plots against his life. Plots that most often never existed. He executed anyone who's even suspected of making a play for his throne. You know, when I think about Herod the Great, I think about politics because he was a politician. And the common denominator for every politician is this. Regardless of political ideology, regardless of generation, regardless of geographical location, all of them want to have their own way. You ever notice that? They demand to have their own way. They draw a line in the sand. No compromise. It's our way or no way. And then I'm thinking, wow, we're all kind of politicians. 
We all like to have our own way. The desire to have your own way, it's at the heart of every marriage conflict, every family conflict, every neighborhood conflict, every church conflict. We just want our way. Herod was an Edomite. Now, that may not make a difference to you. That, that was his, um, his ethnic group. He's an Edomite, which means that he's not of Jewish blood. He had no direct line to King David. The Roman Senate had declared that he would be the king of the Jews, and he didn't have any Jewish blood. That was a problem for the Jewish people, actually. And in his heart, it was a problem for Herod because he was always defending his throne because he knew he didn't deserve it. And he knew that someone, he knew the scriptures, he knew that someone would eventually come who had deserved to hold the seat that he was sitting in. You ever notice his emotional state after the Magi's inquiry? And by the way, the Magi, the wise man, I, I just, I, there are a few memories I have of Christmas as a kid, very clear recollections. And one of them is sitting in a children's program down in the low desert where my dad was a pastor, Indio, California. And while the congregation was singing, we three kings, see, I could have sang Ball of Confusion too, but I just holding back. Remember that song, We Three Kings of Orient Are? And, and, I was, and they were passing out boxes of candy. That's what I remember. I remember it so vividly. And it wasn't the song, it was a candy, I'm sure, that connected those dots for like the rest of my life. But they weren't kings. And the, there weren't three of them. Other than that, the song's like dead on. These magi asked Herod, Matthew 2, verse 2. Where's the one who's been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and we've come to worship him. The Magi were part astro astronomers, astrologers, um, scientists. I mean, they had a lot of disciplines integrated into that fraternity of, of wise men. And so this group had been watching the heavens, and we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Now, I find it fascinating that these guys would connect a star to the Jewish Messiah's birth. How did that connection get made? We'll find out today. So Herod heard this, and he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. Note that. He's not the only one upset. The whole city's uptight about this. And when he had called together all the people's chief priests, teachers of the law, he asked him where the Messiah was to be born, and they said, in Bethlehem in Judea. And so he called the Magi, down in verse 7, called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He wants to get his numbers lined up. And he sent them to Bethlehem and he said, now you go find the child and as soon as you find him, come back and tell me where he is because I would love to worship him too. This guy's a snake. He has no intention of worshiping. Rather, he has an intention of assassinating this kid. And so they found Jesus. By the way, they didn't find him in the manger. Even though that little nativity scene that you got sitting out on your counter says they did, just keep that in mind. I'm not saying you have to take it apart and throw it away. That's not my intent today to ruin your Christmas. I'm just saying that the text is pretty clear. The Magi found Jesus after he was born, probably at the family home in Nazareth. But anyway, after they heard the king, they went on their way. Star they had seen finally reappeared, and it stopped over the place where the child was, and they saw the star, they were overjoyed. Finally, the star, the star stopped. And, and on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him, opened their treasures, presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. That's where we get the three part. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route, skipping down to verse 16. And when Herod realized he'd been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious. He gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem. His intent was to kill the one boy, but since he couldn't identify who the one boy was, he decided to kill every male child under the age of two in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Now you know why all of Jerusalem was disturbed. Because when Herod got uptight, everybody knew they were in trouble. Whenever he threw a tantrum, a lot of people tended to find themselves dead the next day. 
And these magi show up and say, excuse, excuse me, king, but where's the one who should really be sitting in your seat? We've come to worship him, not you. And it wasn't just his conversation with them that freaked out Herod. The Magi were an impressive lot. They were from the Eastern Parthian Empire. And this is what, this quite a distance from Rome. We talk a lot about the Roman Empire. These guys were as powerful as they were a mystery. And Herod knew that when their wise men knocked at your door, something big was happening. I told you before, they were not kings. They weren't. They were the ones who decided who would be king. They were actually, if you want to use our terminology these days, they were the deep state. They were the puppet masters who pulled the political strings behind the scenes. And politicians all over the world knew that when they came to visit, something big was happening, and an official delegation would have been expected at a big national event like the coronation of a foreign king. And so here's this psycho, still paranoid, starting to put all the pieces together. 600 miles is a long trip in the first century. I mean, I'm thinking it's a long trip today. I don't even want to go down the hill. <laughs> 600 miles for these guys across the desert. Yeah, when they traveled that far, See, this is getting to be a problem for Herod. And then when we recognize they never traveled alone, and we don't know how many were in this contingent of magi, of wise men. We do know that when even a small handful of them traveled, history tells us that they would be escorted by at least 1,000 fully armed military cavalry horsemen. So 4,000 hooves thundering through the streets of Jerusalem one night and Herod's head pops off the pillow. Yeah. And, and I'm thinking, well, maybe he'll show a little humility. Maybe, just maybe, Herod will think to himself, okay, I made some mistakes. <laughs> I'm not perfect. But before I die, maybe I should do something right. It's not the way it worked out. When you think about it, it doesn't work out that way very often. You don't just change your MO on your deathbed. You get in that godless groove, that ignore God groove in your life. You think things like, like this, like, oh, I'm just going to have fun now. I'm young. When I get to be old like Pastor Tom, that's supposed to be a joke, but... Um, then maybe I'll get serious, maybe I'll settle down, maybe I'll go to church more, maybe I'll walk with the Lord more closely. But again, we just get in these habits and, and later on, the big turnaround doesn't happen. It didn't happen for Herod. You know what the last two official acts that Herod made as king of the Jews? You know what they were? Number one, he killed the cast of, the, of a Jewish circus because he was afraid that after he died, they might make fun of him. So he had them executed before he died so they wouldn't have the satisfaction of mocking his death. And of course, the second official, last official act was killing every male child under the age of two. Just wanted to make sure this Jewish Messiah, whoever he might be, didn't make it past his second birthday. So it's depressing, actually. What's going on? This conflict that serves as the backdrop for the greatest story ever told. But the cool thing is this conflict and this story between, between Herod the Great and the Magi, that interaction does elevate several principles for us about conflict to consider, especially at Christmas. Conflict is, is everywhere, and it's all around you. It just swirls around you. And me. And I, I, I could be a prophet right now. You could, you could read the book of, of Tom, uh, the prophet Tom. Let me prophesy. You will have conflict in your life this week. 
Yeah, I'm gonna, I'll nail that one. You're going to have conflict in 2020. I mean, we're just going to have conflict. It's just the way the world is. We live on a ball of confusion. So what do we do in response to it? Now, I'm not saying that we should ask God for more conflict so that we could respond well to conflict. But the conflict that's going to be in play, we might as well do what we can to make it work for us instead of against us. Wouldn't it be great to be able to say to your spouse, you know, you know, babe, this conflict between us is going to make us stronger. It's not going to pull us apart. Wouldn't it be great to say to your family, the crazy, crazy schedule of Christmas this year is going to build us up as a family. It's not going to wear us down. Wouldn't that be great? And in this story, there are a couple of ideas I want to give you just four to think about. Because we can make conflict an ally, help us become the people God wants us to be. So respond to conflict. That's okay. We can go back. Respond to conflict in a way that helps build relationships, not destroy them. Okay? A couple of different attitudes that we got to bring to the table. Number one, fill in this blank. I must be patient if I want to recognize, another blank, purpose. If there is purpose in conflict, sometimes you just have to be patient. Got to wait for it, wait for it, wait for it. And then all of a sudden you realize what God's doing. The Magi didn't just show up at Herod's doorstep because they, they showed up at every coronation for incoming royals. This was a setup. I mean, how do Magi, 600 miles away, how do these astronomers look up into the heavens and the smart guys among the Parthians say, oh, Jewish Messiah is going to be born? How do they know that? And why weren't there wise people from other kingdoms parading toward Bethlehem to speak to Herod? Why these guys? Well, there's a reason. It's a historical backdrop. 600 years earlier, there's this kid named Daniel. You read the book of Daniel in the Old Testament? Okay, this kid, when he was no longer a kid, he actually wrote that book. But at this point in time, he's just a teenager. And King Nebuchadnezzar from Babylon, the earlier version of the Parthian Empire, conquered Judah and their capital city of Jerusalem. And that's where Daniel lived. And he was deported with his friends all the way to Babylon. This is what guys like Nebuchadnezzar would do. They would conquer a foreign nation like Judah, Israel. They'd find the smartest kids in the capital city. And then they would... Uh, bring them to, in this case, Babylon, acculturate them in Babylonian ways, brainwash them, train them to be loyal to kings like Nebuchadnezzar, and then send them back to their homeland to rule on Nebuchadnezzar's behalf. That's how it worked, and that's who Daniel was. He was one of the smart kids. And so here he finds himself in, in Babylon, and he's eventually given the chance to serve in Nebuchadnezzar's court. And one night, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, the ruler of Babylon, he's troubled by this bad dream. And what made it worse, couldn't remember what the dream was. This story is in the book of Daniel. It's a great story. He couldn't remember what the dream was. So guess who he called into <laughs> to his, his throne room? And he, he's talking to these guys. He called in the magi, the wise man. He said, you guys are wise. Tell me what I dreamed. And they said, oh, king, live forever, but we don't know what you dreamed. You tell us what you dreamed, we'll tell you what it means. And he said, if you were really legit, you could tell me what I dreamed. And so he called them all phonies and decided they were all going to be killed. And that's a problem for the Magi, and it's also a problem for some Magi interns. One's name was Daniel. And so Daniel prays to God and says, you know, if there's anything I can do, and so God revealed Nebuchadnezzar's dream to Daniel. And that really impressed Nebuchadnezzar. And so in Daniel chapter 2, verse 48, here's part of the story in the text. The king placed Daniel in a high position, lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all of its wise men. Think about it. The same Daniel who wrote the Old Testament book of Daniel, which, by the way, includes a prophetic timetable for the Jewish Messiah's birth, now has the opportunity to rewrite the training manual for this ancient group of Parthian magi. 
And now fast forward 600 years, and their descendants traveled across 600 miles of desert to ask King Herod about the coming Jewish Messiah that their mentor Daniel had taught them about. See, you know what our problem is? Let's just be honest. We like to zoom in like a photographer in a lens, get that zoom lens. And we like to get up close and personal and analyze an event or a short season of our life. And we look real close at what's going on right now. The problem with the zoom lens is that you don't get to see what's going on on the periphery. You can't see over here. You can't see over there. All you see is like right now. And oh, you can see it well. Can't do that in life. Can't focus on one circumstance. See, you got an argument with your spouse and you wonder if your marriage will last. You got a, a difficult conversation with your teenager and you'll, you look at each other and you think, we're a failure as parents. You lose your job and wonder if you'll ever be able to provide for your family again. See, when Babylon conquered Judah, Daniel had every reason to believe his life was over. And then... After Nebuchadnezzar's wise men failed to tell him what he had dreamed, Daniel thought his, his life was over again. But God gave Daniel favor, and then God gave Daniel prominence, and then God gave Daniel visions of when the Jewish king would be born, when the Messiah would come. And six centuries later, Daniel's protégés helped save that same Messiah's life and preserve the mission that Jesus was born to fulfill. You know what I call that? I call that amazing is what I call that. But that whole sequence, you know what it took? A long time. See, if your conflict isn't quickly resolved, you're ticked off, right? I mean, you just want two dots connected, that's all. You got your problem, and God has a resolution. And you pray, Lord, I got this issue. You got a way to solve the issue, so let's start cracking here. And God has got a lot of other dots to connect besides those two. That's the problem with things like this. It's complicated. Divine resolution takes time to crystallize. See, God wants, he wants to resolve your problem, but he also wants you to grow personally. He wants this to grow you into the image of his son, Jesus. And then there are all, always people in your life who are watching the way you handle it. They're watching the way you deal with the stress. They're watching you trust God throughout the season of difficulty. You got your oikos involved. And then there's your ministry to the body of Christ who eventually are going to benefit from what God is teaching you. Now he's going to teach them through you. See, there's a lot of layers to resolution. And what God is trying to accomplish, the star which was compelling the Magi to travel west was bringing all of the components of some very difficult seasons of history all together to honor the one who was orchestrating a comprehensive plan to redeem the world. And that's why when the Apostle Paul was writing the Galatian church in chapter 4, verse 4, he said this, when the set time had fully come, God sent his son. See, God's working it out. He's just doing more than you're giving him credit for. And that same God who's working out the details for the Magi and Herod and the Jewish people, that same God is working out the details in your life. I love what the Apostle Paul wrote when he wrote the Roman church. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Don't conform to the pattern of this world. This world is so stressed. It's focusing on just this and that. And there's so little patience. Everything has to happen so fast. The verse literally reads in the Greek text, don't let the world press you into its mold but be transformed by the renewing of your mind through the Spirit of God so you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and I just highlighted it, his perfect, multi-dimensional will. Yeah, God's doing a lot, man. Just gotta give him a chance. 
Number two, if I'm going to allow this conflict that we got, if I'm going to allow it to help me grow and build relationships, then I have to see the play as more important than the player. Now we're going to talk sports, so sorry if you're not into it. It's going to have to put up with that for a few minutes. Pastor Tom wants to talk about the play, wants to talk about the player. See, players are important to the success of a team. We all know this. But executing the play is the goal. If individual players do what is required of them, but the team does not score, the goal has not been met. You, don't get, you, don't, you just don't get points for making a good pass. You don't get points for setting a good pick. You only get points when the ball goes in the hoop. That's when you get points. See, it's the play. More important than the player. So Herod's a player. And he saw himself as more important than anything. He saw the preservation of his reign as the only outcome that was critical. That's what he needed to protect. The Magi's mission, not important to him. Israel's benefit, not important to him. The Jewish people finally getting the king that they deserve, not important to him. The integrity of the office of king of the Jews, not important to him. That humanity would be saved from our sin, not important. Herod didn't care about the play. He just wanted stats. Yeah, maybe I should ask a question that way to you. You feel like you're more important than the play? Well, what's more important, your marriage's success or making sure you get your way? What's more important, winning the argument or building the relationship? What's more important, the mission of the church or the career of the pastor? What's more important, your hurt feelings or your small group's unity? You always have to ask yourself that question. This is a real important question. What's the play here? And what can I do to help us score? What's the highest goal we're trying to accomplish here? And let's work toward that. See? All of a sudden, conflict brings opportunities. Number three, how about this one? Here's a, another attitude that we can change. I must value the destination more highly than the journey. Well, the Magi taught us that. It wasn't about the journey for them. 600 miles across the desert. I don't care how you're traveling. That's got to be hard. They didn't, they, didn't, they didn't make the trip because they loved the journey. They made the trip because they were looking for something. See, it's about the destination. And, and you know what the destination is? It's finding the truth. For the Magi, they just wanted to find Jesus. And, and the nice thing about Jesus is he wants to be found. In fact, God has always wanted to be found. God reveals himself so many different ways. Look at this. The universe, the cosmos, reveals God's power. God just declares to the world every day, every night, hello, hello. I'm really strong. And the more we study the, this is our term, observable universe, we can't even observe everything he made. God revealed himself in the Bible, revealed his holiness. You learn about God's power in the Bible, but there's a new, <laughs> there, there's a new level of revelation in the Bible. We learn about God's holiness. And then in Jesus Christ, when Jesus came, God revealed himself and how much he loves his power, his holiness, his love. I mean, God just wants, God is saying in so many different ways, he wants you to know him. Hello, 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 come find me. You know what the Magi did? They got off their rear ends and they went and found Jesus. That's what they did. And maybe that's the difference between some of us and them. Hebrews 11.6 says this, Without faith it's impossible to please God. 
because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. The truth is available to find if you look for it. But the truth about God has to be your goal. See, the goal has higher value than the journey. Destination's the key. One guy told me years ago, he said, I said, so what, what you know, religion do you follow? He said, I, I follow all religions. I said, seriously? That's got to be like hard. And he said, well, no, not all at the same time. I just like follow one for a few years and then I try the next one. There are over 10,000 religions in the world. That guy's going to die a lot sooner than he finishes his journey. I said to him, I said, are you just doing this to experiment? Or are you trying to figure out which one is right? It, it's, like I asked, it's like I asked him a question in a foreign language. He goes, well, what do you mean? I said, well, you got, you got to have a destination. Jim Collins, business author, he put it this way. He said, confront the brutal facts because facts are better than dreams. Facts are better than dreams, and the destination is better than the journey. If you were going to take a trip right now, you say, I'm going to go someplace. I'd say, I hope you enjoy your trip. But more than that, I hope you get to the place you think you want to go. Because you take a trip to go someplace. That's why Jesus is so concerned about telling the truth. Remember all those passages Jesus would say, before he said, whatever he taught on, he always, truly, truly, I say to you. You know what that means? I'm telling you the truth. I don't know what those guys are telling you, Jesus said, but I'm telling you the truth. And why did Jesus always want us to know the, the truth? Why did he always want us to get to the destination of truth? Because he knew that the sooner you understand the truth, the sooner you can make a good decision. So you study the heavens. You read the Bible. You consider his son. But if you're going to just sit there and not make that trip, you're going to be left out. The truth is out there. <laughs> Go find it. It's there for those of us who want to know it. Number four. Here we go. There's something else I learned about. About dealing with conflict. And, and I learned this out of the Christmas story. Even this, this conflict between Herod and the Magi. Here we go. Because of Jesus, I have the opportunity to begin again. Everybody needs a start over point. Everybody does. I love the fact that we serve the God of the second chance. And every conflict we experience in life, it provides clarity on what we need to change. Because something needs to change. Figure out what it is and then begin again. You ever wanted, you ever want to begin again about halfway through a project? It wasn't working out for you and, and you just want to throw it away and start over? You ever been halfway through a career, just wanted to throw it away and start over? You ever been halfway through a marriage and wanted to start over? Have been halfway done raising your kids and wish you could start over? Maybe that's what God wants to say to you today. I mean, seriously, maybe he wants to tell you, you know, bro, it's not too late to start over. You know, girl, you can begin again. And this time, God says, I'll do it with you and we'll get it right. Some of you are thinking, well, I got a Humpty Dumpty life. We got a Humpty Dumpty family. All the king's horses, all the king's men couldn't put our family back together again. And what does God say? God says this. He says, forget that. Forget the former things. Don't dwell on the past. God says, I'm doing a new thing. It springs up. What, you can't see it? What, you can't see why, why you're here today? What, you, you, don't, you don't perceive what it is God is trying to tell you like right now today? I'm making a way in the wilderness. You say, our, our family is a wasteland. God says, I'm, I'm bringing streams to that wasteland. 
only Herod the Great had taken Isaiah's words to heart. If only Herod, when those magi came to his door, would have said, I've made a mess of things. I want to start over. Because God specializes in new beginnings. That's what Christmas is, folks. Just starting over. I believe God wants to do something fresh in your home. I believe God wants to do something special, something new in your marriage. And it's never too late to start over. You are never a failure until you give up. Jesus went and met with one of the most religious men in the first century, Nicodemus, one of the spiritual leaders of the Jewish people. He was so religious. And Jesus said, very truly I tell you, there he goes again, I want you to know the truth, Nick. No one can see the kingdom of God unless they start over. Nobody's going to get it until they begin again. And everybody needs a point in their lives where we get to reboot. Only this time, he told Nicodemus, it's not going to be about rules. It's not going to be about religion. It's going to be about a relationship that's not founded in fear. You know, religionists, they're just always scared because they never match up. They got to work harder and harder and harder. If they don't get one religion right, they got to try the next one. And Jesus said, Nick, I want a relationship that's not based on fear, but it's based on love. What do you say? What do you say we, we start over? Why don't, why don't you be born again? You might be thinking it's, it's too late for you. Well, I don't know how old Nick was. It wasn't too late for him. Apostle Paul, remember when God called him? Dude was 40. Abraham, you know when God called Abraham? We read the story of Abraham like it's the beginning of his life. He was 75 you know how old Moses was when God got a hold of his life? He was 80. It's never too late. You know what Christmas is? It's God's way of saying to the whole world, let's start over. That's why he gave us Jesus. And that might be exactly what he's saying to you right now. Let's get it right this time. Let's bow for prayer. Father, I, I'm thankful for Christmas. I'm thankful for this story. It's such a great story, so much conflict, but Lord, we learn so much from it. And I just pray that the conflict in our lives would cause us to all recognize the need to start over. And I don't know if you're sitting in the auditorium here in Victorville or one of our other campuses or you're watching online, but would you be willing to say, Lord, I admit that I've made a mess of things. I admit that I have sinned. I admit that I have failed. I admit that my life is jacked up. And I want to start over, and so I admit that, and I believe. A is admit, B is believe. I believe that Jesus came into the world to save us. And I'm part of us, Lord. I want you to save me. And that's why I choose. Admit, believe, choose. I choose right now, place my faith in Jesus. If Herod would have done that, his life would have ended much differently. Don't harden your heart. Make that choice. Be a great choice. That's what Christmas means. The opportunity to start over. Lord, let's admit and believe and choose to follow you today. Thank you. In Jesus' great name, all God's children said.